I am pleased to welcome our next two speakers that Rob just mentioned, Kenneth and Estelle. Um, <laughs> Dr. Kenneth Grother is a product security leader for, I should have let Rob do this because I think it's Xylem, uh, Applied Water Systems uh, with a PhD in systems engineering, previous roles at GE Global Research, and a principal engineer at MITRE. I'm going through your intros very fast because there's two of you and I don't want to take too much of your time. Estelle is a market and strategy analyst also at Xylem, which I think is correct. Uh, as well, master's in uh, energy systems engineering, a BS in mechanical engineering, previous roles as an acoustic engineer for the US Navy, and a safety systems engineer for Karma Automotive. Um, as you consider the, the presentation we just had kind of in the same sector, and asset owner operator specific engineering approaches around failure considerations and, and uh, continued operation. Our presenters here are going to look at the trends for uh, growth in digitalization and remote monitoring and how this uh, kind of sector is changing and uh, moving across thousands and thousands of sites and traditional uh, expected architectures of the Purdue model and uh, how those are sort of shifting over time in these operating environments um, in, in uh, some concerning ways that need to be need to be discussed. So I'll turn the uh, virtual stage over to both of you. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that intro. Um, I'm gonna flip to the next slide, maybe. Uh, yeah, you got it right, Xylem. Uh, that's how you pronounce it, and so, Xylem is a company where we're solving water by providing equipment such as sensors, drives, controllers, as well as integrated solutions to the water and wastewater sector. I want to start off by thanking Gus and Andrew. That was a great uh, presentation on cybersecurity in the water industry. And I think you really set the stage for what we're going to talk about today. So thanks for getting everyone in the right mindset uh, and excited about thinking about water and cybersecurity. I want to start by introducing you all to a couple of facts about the water industry. The first is it's very lean. It's an industry where we can deliver a ton of material to your door and then take it away for just $3 a ton. That's incredible value. That's incredibly lean, $3 a ton. And the other fact I want to mention is that it's still not lean enough. And we see that because there's pressure to improve global access. Three in 10 people lack access to clean water. Six in 10 people lack access to safely managed sanitation and reclamation services. And then locally, to me, at least in the US, there's just this challenge where our water and wastewater infrastructure is old and it's not as efficient as it should be. So to expand access and to ensure continued access in the industry, we need to go digital. But I think every story, every fact has always you know, helped told be a story. So I'm going to tell a story about South Bend, Indiana. So South Bend, Indiana is a town that was suffering from extreme sewer overflows. How extreme? One to two billion gallons of polluted water every year were being dumped in the St. Joseph River. So a billion is a big number. I find that hard to visualize. So let me break it out for you. So that's equivalent to five to 10 Olympic-sized swimming pools per day of sewage being dumped into the river. So let's repeat that, five to 10 Olympic sized swimming pools of untreated water every day. That's a huge amount. As you can imagine, that caused huge environmental and public health problems. And one of the root causes to this problem was the age of the infrastructure. It couldn't handle the growth of the town or these extreme weather events. And we see this as a theme. You know, We saw that most recently in Texas and Mississippi where the water infrastructure failed because it couldn't handle the extremely low temperatures. So there's this continued problem where our infrastructure needs to up, be upgraded and then it also needs to be expanded. Uh, but that's an aside, so let's go back to South Bend. So they priced out what it would cost to fix this problem and it was going to be close to a billion dollars. Again, a billion is a big number. How do we visualize that? That equates to a burden of close to $10,000 per citizen of South Bend. So that's economically unfeasible given that the average annual household income was 32,000. So a third, of their average annual household income would be what it would cost to fix this problem. So we also begin to see that this problem of sewer overflow is not just environmental. It's also tied to social and economic equality. So they, instead of pursuing this expensive capital expenditure realm, they decided to do something else. And I'm sure you can guess, but you've read the slide, they went digital. 
they installed a real-time monitoring system comprised of 120 sensors um, that leveraged their existing older infrastructure. And this resulted in huge savings. So that's capital expenditure savings of $500 million. So they spent $500 million less than what they were expecting and annual operating and maintenance savings of $1.5 million each year. So that's $1.5 million every year that can be reinvested into the community water and wastewater infrastructure. That's really huge. So they can continue these capital upgrades because they saved money using digital assets. And I really wanna emphasize that it wasn't just financial savings. They also reduced their sewer overflows, which was the main goal by a billion dollars, which then had rippling environmental benefits, including a 50% drop in E. coli concentration, concentrations in the St. Joseph River. Uh, and I think what this story really highlights is that when the water industry goes digital, everyone saves. And the problem in the water industry is not just how do we save money? That's definitely a huge part of it, but it's also how do we save the environment? How do we save lives? And that's because water is intrinsically linked to life. And I don't really need to tell all of you that. Um, I'm sure you get that. Uh, and so digital solutions are a necessary part of that journey. So how do we leverage our existing aging infrastructure in a smarter way so that the money we save can then be reinvested into capital upgrades and the community, the communities being you and I, can benefit through cleaner and better managed water systems. So hopefully you all understand that, you know, digital solutions are the key to solving the global water crisis. And as we all know, and why we're sort of all here, is we know that digital solutions come with their own set of challenges, namely being cybersecurity. And I'm not gonna to spend too much time talking about the problems. Um, here's a slide with some facts, but I wanna highlight that these, are, these cybersecurity problems are happening in the water industry today. It's the third most targeted sector compared to other critical infrastructure, and it's costing utilities millions. So when I say we need to go digital, what exactly does that mean? On the left, you'll see the traditional Purdue model for cybersecurity, and on the right, you'll see um, sort of where the industry is trending. So we have um, this convergence in the water industry as well as other tangential critical, critical infrastructure such as electricity and oil and gas, where there's this convergence of OT and IT. Uh, so these low cost IOT and smart sensing devices are enabling the transfer of data from the utility offsite to a vendor gateway and cloud solution and then that data is optimized and outcomes are produced and those optimizations and outcomes are passed back to the utility for implementation. And that's really huge. We're building infrastructure and solutions that can centrally optimize a number of utilities, which drastically increases the leanness of the industry. So like, again, we go back, leanness. When we become more lean, we're saving money, we're saving lives, we're saving the environment. This is really huge. And I wanna highlight that this transfer of data across this trust boundary from the utility to the vendor really highlights the need for partnership developing these cybersecurity solutions. So as we saw with South Bend and hundreds of other stories like that, um, the benefits of this technology change are huge. They're unquestionable. We will be going digital because that's, that's how we're gonna save these, this money. That's how we're gonna save these lives. And so I really wanna highlight that this idea of partnership is not new in the water industry. Um, it's been used for years. Uh, the multi-barrier approach in the water and wastewater industry is part of the reason why the industry can stay so lean. And I wanna highlight it's not a tech stack. It is multiple parties utilizing their comparative advantage across the value chain to protect and deliver clean water. What does that actually mean? It's this idea of collaboration and that no one party has to solve water on their own. We have legislation, which is providing source water protection, um, treatment guidelines. We have monitoring, which exists across the value chain to allow for downstream and upstream adjustments, as well as quality checks so that you and I know we're drinking clean water. And then treatment, which has multiple tech steps for redundancy to ensure uh, water is treated and delivered to us clean, and then water is removed from us and then delivered to the environment clean. And then the thing that sort of connects all of these is this robust transport and delivery network um, that delivers water to you and then takes water away and delivers it to the environment. So there's this shared goal, which is delivery of clean water. 
And I think it really raises the question of how can this multi-barrier approach uh, serve as a model for how we can implement cybersecurity solutions in the water and wastewater industry? So I wanna sort of turn it over to Kenneth to continue that train of thought. Yeah, so since this uh, presentation is kind of a call out to the ICS security community to come help us solve this problem, we wanted to make sure that it was really clear this context um, in which the water industry is operating. First, this idea that the water industry needs to be lean. Um, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I don't think we want to pay more than three dollars per ton, uh, even though that is significant uh, uh, savings compared to any other sector. Um, and then the second thing I want to emphasize is that the water industry has been solving these these types of problems with this multi-barrier approach. And before you, you go too far and think that this is exactly the same as defense in depth, uh, I wanna emphasize what Estelle said that this is more than just a tech stack. Um, this is the water industry recognizing the comparative advantage of different players and pulling the energies of those players together in order to solve a problem that's bigger. The problem in this case is protecting safe drinking water. Um, protecting uh, the sanitation of our environment by reclaiming the dirty water uh, appropriately. And imagine how expensive water would be if the utility, for example, had to, to drive the legislation to protect the source uh, um, of where the drinking water is coming from. Or if uh, uh, utilities that shared similar uh, you know, water sources, uh, a similar aquifer or a similar uh, watershed aren't collaborating for monitoring uh, capabilities and sending downstream and upstream uh, their readings. This uh, partnership is what's led to them being able to deliver clean water in such a lean way. And this partnership is what we need to extend into the cybersecurity area. So there's three things that we really wanna talk about. One is what does this partnership, the cybersecurity partnership in the water and wastewater sector need to protect against? So we wanna talk a little bit about the threats. The second is, what does a multi-barrier approach really look like? And we have kind of a thought experiment to go through selecting what those barriers look like. And then third is what that partnership would be. So let's, so let's talk about uh, those threats. So um, what we've been doing is we've been researching what threat activity groups are targeting or, or have targeted water or, or wastewater utilities or water wastewater technologies uh, around the around the globe. Uh, we've so far identified seven threat activity groups um, that have historically targeted water, wastewater. We're using the MITRE attack model that everyone seems to be fairly familiar with and uh, seems to be a, a, of conversation. You'll notice uh, on here that the, we're only listing 16 of those techniques out of the 50 or so that are in the attack for ICS uh, model. And that's because that's what we've seen um, in the uh, water and wastewater industry so far. Now, we will need to future-proof this. And uh, just as an example, uh, we know that uh, parasite and magnalium seem to have some kind of connection where parasite gains some persistence and then magnalium does bad things. We haven't seen magnalium uh, techniques uh, against the water wastewater sector yet, but the fact that we've started to see parasite um, related behaviors uh, means that that's something that we're going to probably have to future-proof ourselves from. So we are paying attention to that, but for this, we're focusing on these 16 techniques and these seven um, attack uh, threat activity groups. So the thing that I want to point out is that we need to uh, protect against all the activity groups, but we don't necessarily need to protect against all of their techniques. And this multi-barrier uh, approach thought experiment kind of illustrates that. So we'll, uh, we're gonna use a fault tree to kind of give you an example of how this might work. So let's suppose that there's a 10% chance that any one of these threat activity groups will attack your, um, will target your particular water utility. Um, now this 10% this uh, is, is made up and, and, and is assumed for the purpose of this experiment, but it's not inconsistent with uh, some realities. Um, so, the baseline, the EPA's report uh, on baseline information on malevolent acts for community water systems. Um, it has a section on the frequent, the estimated frequency of cyber attacks, um, 
against the utility enterprise system and against the utilities um, uh, control system. And so in there, it says that uh, the control systems will have probably one, one attempted attack per year, and that 10% of those attacks will be uh, framed in such a way that they would cause a health or environmental impact. Um, so for the purpose of this thought experiment, it becomes convenient because seven uh, parallel threat activity groups um, against uh, our selection of uh, utilities ends up resulting in a 50% chance that you'll be attacked, which is a maximum uncertainty. So let's now talk about the barriers. Um, so the, uh, the most common technique that we saw was phishing attacks. And so we want to have some barriers against these phishing attacks. The second most common technique that we saw was the use of valid accounts, uh, this idea of credential harvesting and then using them. Now, um, this, this, this does actually help us with a little bit of future proofing because it turns out that this use of valid credentials is one of the most common uh, uh, attack techniques used across all of critical infrastructure. And so those that are in the energy sector or oil and gas sector that plan to pivot into uh, attack water um, are probably using these types of behaviors. So what this, what this chart is showing that even if we assume that there's a 50% probability that this uh, barrier will be defeated, then as you start to add these layers, these barriers, then that 50% original attack rate reduces, uh, even with this assumed ineffectiveness, reduces all the way down to 10%. And it would reduce further, but we're still not having, we still don't have any protections against this uh, one threat activity group parasite. And so if we go to the next, uh, the, uh, the next slide, yeah, this one, um, then one of the, the main behaviors that Parasite is using is this exploitation of remote services. So we start to put in this third barrier, and now what originally started as a 50% probability of attack is now less than uh, a fraction of 1% um, in terms of the, the ability of that attack to be successful. And remember that this is assuming a 50% uh, you know, defeat probability of any of these individual barriers. So, but what I, what I want to point out, though, is the implementation of these barriers, if we were to, to load this all onto the utilities, then it, it comes with enormous expense. And that expense uh, uh, can't, be, um, uh, can't be tolerated in the water sector that's seeking for this leanness. And so this is where we need this kind of partnership. And I'll just point out, uh, for example, access logging and monitoring. If you're using devices that aren't tagging anything, then uh, all of a sudden it becomes very expensive to create um, a logging system. And if you don't have a logging system or a collection management framework, then all of a sudden it becomes expensive for the utility to have to create this kind of collection management and uh, incident response capabilities um, from scratch. And so this is an example of where a partnership starts to matter, right? The product supplier starts to build in, they build devices that have the appropriate logging. The integrator uh, architects the networks around, a, around these products and their capabilities such that they can collect, collect this and establish a collection management framework before commissioning. And then the commission system that is operated by the utility, now uh, they spend the time maintaining that system. And so this is, this is, this is the, uh, kind of the big picture that we want to make sure is clearly communicated, that this multi-barrier approach needs to be implemented through a partnership. And so, so what, what might this partnership look like? Um, so this, this security shield tries to capture some of the main uh, components of, of a cybersecurity partnership across the water sector, specifically to help to uh, communicate the differentiation between these different uh, activities. So on the very left is securing the product, right? It's a secure development framework, um, finding those weaknesses and fixing them prior to uh, commercialization. On the very right is secure deployment. It's understanding the weaknesses in products and having a, a network architecture that has compensating controls. On the very bottom is 
the continuous uh, evaluation of those products because those products are being updated, uh, patches are being released, um, and uh, there's communication that needs to happen across the boundaries where those products are sold and connected. And then at the very top is the incident response. So what would what would this partnership look like? Um, so let's think. Let's let's give an example of just three: the the product supplier, the integrator, and the operator, the utility. So on the product supplier side, there they have a comparative advantage to build in a security into products. And the more that we as an industry start to understand these things, the more likely these requirements will be pushed into uh, uh, how products are evaluated and, and uh, secure products will uh, continuously improve and emerge. The secure development framework looks something like this on the right, right? There's a, uh, as soon as you're planning a product, you're training your employees to be able to recognize the weaknesses. As you're doing the design, you're doing a threat model and you're establishing a controls baseline that addresses the things that are in the attack surface that you're aware of. As you're doing development, you're evaluating those third party features uh, and you're um, testing that uh, your controls framework is adequate. Finally, as you're approving this uh, product for readiness for market, you're issuing secure deployment guides, and then you're continuously uh, monitoring the customer use of your product uh, as the product is out in the market. The product supplier has a competitive advantage to put in these kinds of features, to design in, to, to assure that all functions have roles, all roles are tied to authentication processes, that these roles are differentiated based on how important they are, right? That everything is logged and uh, that the logs are accessible in a, a, a uniform way. So let's, let's move on to talk about the integrators. So the integrators have a development process, but it looks very different than the, the product suppliers and it puts them in a position where they have a different competitive, uh, a comparative advantage in order to contribute to this, this overall security picture. Um, these, these are engineering contractors um, that uh, have awareness of different products and different features that those products uh, provide. They're the ones that are coming up with the architecture. They're the ones that have the, the, uh, the, the um, greatest opportunity to identify what kind of segmentation, where they should be doing monitoring, what the access control as a, in the, uh, as the, um, the overall uh, uh, plant should look like, um, how to control configuration, what that uh, collection management framework might initially look like. Um, and, uh, and they can help the utility to be able to establish this basic uh, uh, process for continuous monitoring. And then if we look at the utilities, if these foundations are established, now the utilities aren't creating their, their entire um, uh, cybersecurity stack from scratch. Now, those partners that have the comparative advantage are contributing to this overall uh, security process in a way that the sector can maintain its leanness. And uh, ultimately, in the end, um, the thing that, that they are left with is this, this idea of incident response, being able to appropriately use the logs that, uh, that they have in order to identify events, um, to be alerted to those events that are uh, more risky, and to then be able to respond adequately. So the, the bottom line uh, is that, uh, um, just to kind of recap some of the, the important things that we've talked about, the, the water sector is um, extremely lean. And uh, we, we want this presentation to be kind of a call to uh, the entire ICS security community to come help us solve this problem, but help us solve it in the context of the water industry, um, in the context of the water sector. Uh, this, the digital transformation that the water sector is going through is helping us to improve our leanness um, and is helping to move that shared, the, the burden of, uh, 
how digital information and data is positioned and protected um, in, in order to set it up for a partnership. What we need in the water sector is a multi-barrier approach that involves collaboration and engagement across those parties, which means that we're going to have to come up with ways to more clearly communicate across the different uh, suppliers, uh, integrators, engineering groups, um, the legislators, the, um, the oversight uh, uh, commissions. Um, we, we need to come up with, with a, common, a common language to talk about these things. And in the near term, some of the areas where we can really start is first, um, we need strong access control. Uh, we hope that all utilities are demanding it. Um, we hope that all product suppliers are building it out, um, that they are uh, checking and double checking it, that the integrators are assuring that, uh, that this is, uh, that access control is adequately um, completed in the, in the product space. The second thing is uh, we need better capabilities for collection management uh, and response. And again, this is something that, uh, that we can partner around. The product vendors can start uh, tagging and logging those things that are relevant to uh, cybersecurity. The integrators can start taking advantage of those and building a collection management framework um, in, in consultation with the utilities that they're providing product to. And then the final thing is that we really need an IIoT looking reference architecture. Um, we need something that uh, embraces the fact that uh, the water sector is moving digital and has to maintain leanness and will require this kind of partnership um, across these different roles. And so with that, we, we kind of call out to the ICS security community to come and help us solve this problem in this context. Um, so thank you. Uh, Estelle, did you wanna add anything else? <laughs> Now I think you got it covered, Kenneth. Great work. This is awesome. I appreciate it. You uh, you have a lot of praise going in your hallway channel. Um, I I think kind of the way you framed the normal operating normal goals of uh, clean, safe delivery of product, water to customers, and the partnerships that exist across the sectors, and the need to take that same model and move it into kind of cybersecurity vendor integration uh, vendors and integrators. Um, need for reference architectures to be built. Those are all things that people on this call and are on this, uh, um, in the summit, the thousands that are here, there's a number that are looking at similar challenges across their own environments and their own sectors. And um, there's a lot of overlap and there doesn't need to be kind of these sector silos that are built, um, especially when you're talking about IIoT reference architectures. That seems to me something that is a community that can be tackled and pursued and and uh, absolutely would help many, many other areas. Um, we are approaching lunch, but I do want to ask a, a very quick question in regards to acknowledging there's no limit limitless uh, budgets and looking at kind of uh, resources that exist, organizations like uh, AWWA and the Water ISAC and looking through kind of their um, uh, resources for doing self-assessments and looking towards kind of 15 recommendations of things you can do. I'm just looking for, with your depth of experience and working in this space, um, to what level do you, would you estimate people are consuming those resources that are available and actually using them? So doing, doing self-assessments, following kind of 15 practices of things to go and do, um, the resources are there. Is is the constraints on budget, staff, resources, um, are they so great that even with some uh, some guidance, it's still hard to take that first step forward for some sectors? Yeah. So I, I think uh, so. I'll respond first, Estelle. Uh, the, the the thing that I would call to to everybody's attention is that uh, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but there's like eight thousand water utilities in the U.S. And uh, not all of them are like New York City or LA or something like that. A lot of them are, you know, the guy, the guy who goes out and uh, does the maintenance is also the guy that cuts the grass uh, at headquarters. And uh, so this this is one of the reasons why, uh, from our perspective, 
there needs to be um, there needs to be a burden shared and not that everything needs to be not pushed onto the utilities, even though they are the end owners of this infrastructure. There needs to be a shared burden. And that means uh, I think that uh, there might be a better if effect if there's a recognition that there needs to be guidance that's specific to product vendors and maybe our top 15 for what we should, we should not sell anything to the water wastewater sector that doesn't meet these 15 criteria um, or to the integrators, right? No product should be commissioned that doesn't meet these criteria. Um, and I think that uh, that might get uh, a much broader, uh, that might have, might have a much broader impact than just, you know, the top 15 to the utilities uh, who are burdened, uh, you know, with providing the water and wastewater. I think the product vendors in this space actually know more about the products. I mean, not, not, I guess that's not surprising. <laughs> know more about the products than, um, than the utilities do. Also uh, in, in the hallway chat and a number of questions await you there, but uh, reference to the top 20 um, secure PLC coding practices project that uh, again, kind of like an IOT architecture project, kind of this community led lots of different people involved and in contributing to, to work towards a common solution that applies across multiple sectors. But um, yeah. I love that. I wish there was a version of that for the firmware uh, <laughs> that goes into the controller um, for, for those of us who are actually building the controllers and not the software that goes on it. Of course, of course. All right, any closing comments before we all go off to lunch or fake lunch or whatever time zone we're in? Um, let's, let's solve water. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> I appreciate it. Two, two great, uh, talks back to back, um, on this sector that is important to every one of us in all of our lives and really highlights a lot of things across any critical infrastructure, not just the water sector as well. We appreciate it. Thank you both. Um, lots of people waiting for your attention in the, uh, the hallway channel. So, uh, good luck. <laughs>